The reading today comes from Colossians 3, 22 to 4, verse 1. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Well, it is a privilege and delight to be here to talk about something I'm so passionate about. <laughs> I think uh, most of the time at nine o'clock I kept biting my tongue uh, because there was so much to say about this subject um, and I really want to explore it uh, together with you. Let's just uh, take a moment just to bring ourselves into God's presence uh, more consciously. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have together. Thank you that we can consider these verses. I pray that you would speak deeply to our hearts this morning and we would know your truth. Amen. Excellent. And hello to the people at home as well. Wholeheartedly for the Lord. This is what we want to be, isn't it? This is what we desire. We are Christians. We want to be wholehearted in what we do, in everything we do. Well, this is what we're going to learn about this morning. This is what's asked of us, and we're going to hear some ideas about what that might look like in all the areas of our lives. The passage uh, that we're looking at is part of a section known as the Household Codes. There were codes written at this time. They were quite familiar bits of writing, recommendations for how you would conduct your household. Uh, You've heard about um, marriages. You've heard about parenting. The other part of the household, which feels a bit weird to our ears, is the idea of slaves and masters. But of course, they were part of the household at this time. In fact, there are estimates that in Colossae, up to three quarters of the population may have been slaves. That just blows our minds, doesn't it? How is that possible? Because sometimes I think we have in our minds slavery as in the American slave experience. Uh, But back there, slaves were numerous. They were used regularly as part of the work that was done, and sometimes they suffered terribly. It is true that in terms of uh, slavery at that time, if you were the master of a slave, you basically owned the body of the slave. So you had the right to treat them like you wanted to treat them, and there was violence and there was sexual abuse of slaves. But there's a whole range of experiences. So there were also slaves. I've got a picture there of Downton Abbey, just in case you were wondering. That's weird. Um, Slaves could also be trusted servants in the house, people who were very much a part of the household, who felt familiar in terms of being part, who were treated well. That was part of the slave experience as well. And for the slaves, there could be a moment when you may be adopted into the family. You were so valued, so prized that you became part of the family. So a whole range of different experiences for slaves in Colossae. Now, when we read this passage, there's probably a moment when we think, oh, rats, I really wish that Paul had said there shouldn't be any slaves. That's what we sort of hunger for and desire for, isn't it, looking at this and knowing the problems we have even in our world with slavery. But Paul doesn't outright condemn slavery in this passage. Why did he not do that? I think there's a few reasons. One is we forget that where they were living, the context in which they were living at this time was not a democracy. It wasn't a place where you could have a protest and then say, we won't vote for you unless you don't do what we want. It wasn't like that. There was Roman rule. There was no chance of this small Christian church, as it was in that time, being able to exert the sort of political pressure that would bring about any change. As well as that, Paul seems to have adopted this idea of pragmatism. 
uh, a pragmatism of quietism. What he encouraged people to do was to live lives within society, and the focus was on growing these transformational communities that were beginning to spring up. And Colossians tells us how to live as a transformational community. We also need to remember that slaves couldn't escape from the situation in which they were. So they're being given advice on how to live within that situation, that they shouldn't lose heart. This is what they should do within their context. And the other thing to remember, um, in the next chapter, you'll hear about Onesimus, that name. I wonder if that name's familiar to you. Onesimus was a slave who had run away, who had escaped. There's a book in the Bible, Philemon, which is Paul's letter to Philemon, who is the master of Onesimus. And he's saying Onesimus is going to return to Philemon. So there's a possibility that this is a community where, you know, Onesimus became a Christian and he ran away. Maybe that started to cause some unrest. So there's all these things going on. We don't really know the mind of Paul, but he doesn't outright condemn slavery there. However, this is not just mere social conformity. What we have here are the seeds of a message that is going to give birth to the end of slavery. It takes a fair while to work its way through, but there are some amazingly... Uh, incredible messages here that are going to change the way society functions forever. For one thing, Paul addresses slaves directly. And we might just read that and think, oh, well, but that's quite unique amongst the household codes. There was lots of recommendations for how masters should treat their slaves. But Paul's writing to slaves themselves. Clearly, he is seeing them as equal members of the community. That's pretty amazing. If you were a slave in Colossae, the one time you felt truly valued and equal as a human being was in the church when you gathered with God's people. It's a pretty amazing thought for them. There were probably more slaves in this church than masters. One of the great criticisms of the early church was that it was full of slaves, women, and children. I mean, you couldn't possibly take a religion seriously if that's what it was like. But the message of Jesus, as we hear communicated here, was so powerful to those people because it treated them like real people, like equal human beings with equal value. But the other thing that Paul does, uh, which is unusual, it's known as the ethic of the disadvantaged. What he does is he says, even though you are lesser outside these walls of the church, even though you're considered that in society, you can actually live as if you're in a flourishing relationship. You can show people what it looks like. You can show the difference that Jesus makes. You can actually start to transform relationships by the way you act. It's very challenging. It's very hard but he encourages those who are considered lesser to act in a way that is far greater, to model upwards, as it were. And these are the seeds that, from that time, began to completely transform people's concept of slavery. So what are the foundations for our passage? I just want to reiterate these because it was a few weeks ago that you, you heard these verses. Verse 15 says, May the peace of Christ rule your hearts. Remember, he's about to talk to slaves, people who had a lot of unrest, a lot of discomfort, and he's told them that there's peace in Christ. Secondly, in verse 16, he talks about the message of Christ dwelling among you richly. And this is the message of Christ that he's been talking about, the gospel, the good news, the good news that Jesus is sovereign over everything, that Jesus is reconciling everything to himself. He's changing everything they know and see as normal around them in society. And then verse 17, a key verse that prefaces all this, do everything in the name of Christ. That verse is in word and deed, but it means everything you do when those words are put together. So not just in church on a Sunday, not just when you gather in a Bible study or community group, everything you do, Everything you say, whatever context 
God has placed you in. Honor Jesus. Model Jesus. Remember that you are in Christ. We've sung about the beautiful name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus. That is the one that we are to show other people. And we reach now our passages, this advice to slaves. The first thing that Paul says is to obey your masters. Verse 22, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. You hear that echo. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. So Paul is saying, don't just do these things so that you can win favor for yourself. Don't focus on yourself in this, your own activity. Focus on the Lord. Do it with sincerity too. Do it with all your heart, as he's going on to repeat. Do it as an act of reverence. Do it as an act of worship. You're honoring God when you do this. He's saying that the slaves need to be single-minded in purpose, that focused. Obey and do it out of worship to the Lord. The next verse actually begins to um, repeat that in a way. It reinforces it but adds something more. So it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And this is where we realize where the real emphasis is. It's on God. That's why we should work. Because we can work at it as if we're working for God. And we should do it with passion. We should do it with energy. We shouldn't do it reluctantly. And how can we do this? Where do we get this from? Well, we are in Christ. We are animated by the Holy Spirit. We have so much more. We can do this. Work is pointing to God. What he's doing is actually building on what he's already told them in Colossians 2, verses 6 to 7. He says, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Saying, walk with Christ in this that you're doing, in all the different work that you do. And again, just as for slaves, they weren't paid for their work as such. When God sees what we do, he's not just thinking about the paid work we do. He's thinking about all the things we do with intent or purpose. How can we do this? How could these slaves possibly do this in the conditions they were in? Well, the next verse gives us a clue. Paul says, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. See, that's the difference. That's the difference between us and the person who's a malicious gossip in the workplace bringing people down. The difference between us and the person who's monstrously ambitious treading over everyone else to get to the top. Between us and the person who's a workaholic who can't switch off from work is just doing it all the time. We have perspective, we have hope, we have a long vision. We know there is an eternal reward. It might be a delayed reward, especially for the slaves. They might not be rewarded for their wholehearted service in this life, but there would be a reward that they're promised. He's echoing something a lot earlier in uh, verse 12 in chapter 1. He said, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He's reminding them of this inheritance. Think who he's speaking to, slaves. And he tells them, You have an inheritance in the kingdom of light. It wouldn't have been lost for the people who heard this message, for the slaves, but there's an enormous paradox here. Because as a slave in the Roman Empire, you could not inherit anything. You couldn't say anything was yours. You owned nothing. 
But suddenly here, Paul is telling them they have this inheritance. They are going to inherit the kingdom of light. They are truly heirs. And this is the third time that Paul's mentioned that Jesus is their Lord and Master, and he's used slightly different language each time. And he's reminding them that Jesus is their Savior, that Jesus is their Lord, that Jesus is sovereign over everything they do. They're to keep an eternal perspective, and then Paul builds on that in the next verse. He says, Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. He's saying that ultimately God's justice will rule. There will be a time when each person will face judgment. Those who have worked wholeheartedly will receive their reward. Those who do wrong will be punished. God doesn't play favorites here. He sees what's in your heart. There's consequences for the actions. This would be a message of comfort for the slaves, especially if they're undergoing that unjust treatment. They know that ultimately there will be justice, that the masters will be punished if they've treated them badly. But there's a warning for slaves here too, that they actually need to continue to live and work out in integrity. They have to maintain their high standards. So this is the message to slaves. But Paul doesn't leave it there. He goes on to talk to their masters. And probably at this time, he's particularly addressing the male head of the household, the paterfamilias. He's already spoken to the, them as a husband, to them as a father, and now he talks to them as the master. However, in saying that, um, it always makes me think of my big fat Greek wedding uh, <laughs> when uh, the woman says that, yes, the master is the head, but I am the neck that moves the head. <laughs> and in these times, the woman of the household was known to basically run the household as well. So they're incorporated in this. Paul has these recommendations for those who lead. Masters, Provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Masters, too, are slaves. They, too, are slaves or servants of Christ. How confronting that language is in this divided society. How it must, must have made them just stop and think as masters, you too are slaves. You're all equal. We're all slaves under Christ. And in a counterweight to that concern for slaves to keep working no matter what's happening, it says masters, Christian masters, should act with justice. They should do what is right. They should do what is fair. That idea of fair treatment at this time was revolutionary. There was nothing under law that required masters to treat slaves well. But Paul says, you must do that as a Christian. This is what is required of you. It goes far beyond the legal requirement. Jesus expects far more. There's comfort for slaves in this message to masters. There's comfort because they are brought to the same level that masters are. And there's a warning for masters here too. They must not abuse their power. They too are slaves of Christ. They must serve the Lord who is master in heaven. So all of this passage has been talking uh, to slaves at this point, And we, we need to realize that this is different to our experience of work. It's not an exact representation. This is probably the closest we come in the Bible to some wisdom about the working relationship because there is this idea of working for someone um, and having a master or a boss. So there is that idea here, but it's not exactly the same. In fact, slaves had no agency about their lives. They couldn't choose what they would do. They had no rights, and yet they're told to obey wholeheartedly and work wholeheartedly. They're told to keep that eternal perspective. They're told to trust in God's justice. So how much more should we who work 
work wholeheartedly. We who do have so much agency, who have so many rights. In this passage, we have this message that tells us that genuine service in an honest vocation does honour God. God watches over us. He sees how we steward our time, how we steward our resources, how we steward our gifts and skills. We can work in partnership with God. As employees, we can serve well. We can work as if we're honouring God. We can serve others. And if you do have the privilege of being a leader, well, then you should treat your team in a way that is fair. You should do what is right. Now, I want to make this a bit more real, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples. The first example is washing up. I wanted to choose that because I figure it's the sort of work that all of us do, pretty much. Washing up. Now, I don't know about your house, but in my house, the person who cooks is not required to do the cleaning up or the washing up, okay? Uh, that's the rule. The rule is not always followed. Um, it's, it's a matter of great concern to me that that rule is not followed. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, my husband and I bought a business in March. It was hire a hubby Mossman. Uh, he saw a couple of his, uh, <laughs> of his clients this morning. Um, he works really hard. He works longer hours. And uh, most of the burden of cooking has fallen on my shoulders. And sometimes he falls asleep before he does the washing up. There you go. I've said it out loud. Now, I have a choice. I can go out there to the kitchen, see those pots and pans that aren't going to fit in the dishwasher, and I can grumble about it. And as I'm doing the washing up, I can have in my heart a sense of great resentment. Um, I can think about the ways that I'm going to just subtly let them know that this is not good, that I'm not just sort of some barefoot woman in the kitchen doing his slave work. I can do it like that. Of course, I never would. This is hypothetical. But <laughs> I could use it as a form of manipulation. Next day, just subtly hint to him that he owes me big time because I did the washing up. But that's not great work, is it? In fact, it's, it's really hopeless because all it does is make me more resentful and destroys our relationship. Another way I could do it is to see that doing that washing up is a way of serving the Lord. Now, it may sound a bit mechanical the first time you do it, but if you see that as an opportunity to honor God, as a sort of spiritual discipline, as a sacrifice, then it makes it a lot easier. And as I wash up, I often think about all the sins that I'm washing away <laughs> with those bubbles. The reality is that we have a way of choosing how we do that work, even if it's work that we feel is not ours properly to do or we feel others haven't done what they should do. If we do it with a heart that wants to serve God, it changes the way we see that work. And I think if you can't work like that, if you can't do your work and can't see it as a way of serving God, then maybe you shouldn't be doing that work. Maybe you should not do that work for the sake of your soul. Uh, I knew I was going to be preaching this. I knew I was going to be talking about this. And there was one time in the last week where I didn't wash up because I knew I couldn't do it with a heart of serving God. But I just put aside all the resentment and I just got on with stuff. The way we do work, the way we do things really matters. And our heart with the way we do it matters. So what does wholeheartedly working for God look like? What difference does it make? I want to tell you about Angela. Angela is a friend of mine. Um, she, she read my book, and as she was reading my book, she started texting me, and she was saying, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. And she texted me this text that said, I can't believe God cares about my work. And that just really hit me. 
She said she'd been sitting in the pew Sunday after Sunday thinking she wasn't a real Christian because real Christians are the people who are up there on the stage or the people over there in another country or doing something else. Every day when she went to work, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, she felt a bit of a failure for God. She said to me that as she read, she realized something completely different about her work. She said she used to go to work and she used to sort of take God along in her backpack. And every now and then during the workday, if she had the chance, she would open the backpack, just let him out for a moment, you know, mention something about going to church on Sunday or something, and then put him back in the backpack and carry on with the work. But suddenly she realized God is there. God is there in her workplace. He's already at work. He's sovereign over the whole world. He's sovereign over her workplace. She started to look for his fingerprints, and she suddenly began to realize he was there. He was doing stuff, and she'd had her eyes closed to it all along. There are a few different things that happened that enabled her to begin to see her work in a very different way. One was that she realized that she had this capacity to treat everyone equally. She realized she was the first person that some people came to. She worked in a hospital. She was the first person they came to at a point of need, deep hurt. She realized that even though she saw herself as just an administrator behind a desk, she had this amazing ability to influence the people who came to her because they were at a point of need. The other thing she realized, the other thing that God brought up was that she used to treat everyone the same, uh, whether they were the cleaner or whether they were the CEO. And one day the cleaners came to her and said there was a problem that was being overlooked, a health issue. Well, she was able to use her influence to be able to speak into the CEO's ear and tell him about the problem. She would never have seen her work as something that was do anything for God, except she began to see her work differently. She began to see that she could work wholeheartedly for God where she was in that place. And it changed the way she saw her work. And it changed the way that she could work with God in that place. I think we need vision for how we do our work. See, what Angela discovered is that she could make her work an offering to God. She could obey her human masters, but she could really be working for her master in heaven. And that's what I want to symbolically do now. You see, in the early church, there wasn't this separation between work and church. In the early church, People used to do communion and the baker would bring the bread and the butcher would bring the meat and the farmer would bring the vegetables. The woman who dealt in linen would have a tablecloth. They'd sit down, they'd eat out of pots that had been made by someone. Work was real, work was there, it was present all the time. We've even found mosaics in the early Christian communities in Venice and what do you think the mosaics had? Well, they had pictures of people working workplaces. Because work wasn't something that was out there. Work was something that was part of what you did as church. You heard the uh, call out during the week to bring something that might be a symbol of your work. Maybe you did that or maybe you forgot. That's okay because actually we've got people who have bits of paper and pens. If you want to write down uh, the sort of work that you do or to dedicate it. But we've got a chance now to bring those things and lay them at the cross. We did that at 9 o'clock, and I got a bit teary, actually. It was very, very moving. It was a beautiful moment. As we saw people come forward, people brought all sorts of things. There was a nappy. It was clean. I was grateful. Uh, <laughs> there was a little drink bottle. There was a little barista coffee cup. There was a guy who is a painter, and he brought a little chisel thing that he uses for painting. And then there was a woman I assume is an artist or something. She had this beautiful paintbrush. There were all sorts of things that were brought there. I never got to ask the guy who brought the soccer ball. I'm not sure what he does, but anyway, anything. Here's a chance for us to symbolically bring something that occupies our day and bring it to the Lord. Um, my friend Emily came. She is a really keen gardener. She had a trowel, a gardening trowel that she brought. 
I'm going to lead us off, but we're just going to have a time and opportunity to come forward and just lay those things on the cross. And if you don't happen to have something, um, then uh, Andrew will bring around a bit of paper. Yeah, put your hand up and uh, there can be a bit of paper and a pen and you can write down. And here's a way that we can just do this now. We can say we're going to dedicate our work to the Lord. Um, I'm going to lead off and I've brought my pen, my very special pen, my fountain pen, and uh, I'm going to lay it at the foot of the cross. Uh, there will be a chance to get the things back. Don't panic. We almost had two extra phones this morning, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to lay this at the cross. And when you're ready and if you feel prompted, there's nothing compulsory about this, then come forward and dedicate your work to God. Look at that variety. Isn't it amazing? All the different things that people do. Um, I'm particularly interested in the giant spider that's there. <laughs> Slightly frightened. Uh, hoping the eggs are doing okay. Um, yeah, there's some beautiful images there, aren't they, of the daily things that we can offer to God. You're never too old to offer what you do to God. Um, I remember there's a story about one lady and her front line, she realized was uh, the shop, the general store. She couldn't walk very far, but she could walk to that store. And she would walk into that store, and she would talk to the people there. And when she realized that God was interested in what she did with purpose and intent, she realized that developing relationships with the storekeepers, showing them love and compassion was her way of actually living wholeheartedly for God in that context. Everything you do can make a difference. I want to reassure you that God cares for you. He longs to work with you in your daily work. He wants to be at the center of everything you do, and what you do can be an act of worship to him. What we've done here is just symbolically say, yes, I'm ready to do that. I want you to have your eyes and heart open with, to how God can actually do that. 
God didn't just redeem your souls for heaven. He redeemed what you are, who you are, and what you do for every day. And he, you're part of his process of reconciling and redeeming this world through your daily work. So let's seize that and claim that and rejoice in that. Let me just pray for us with what we've done. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to lay who we are and what we have at your feet. I pray, Lord, that just as we have put these precious things at the cross today, that during this week you will remind us that we can work wholeheartedly for you, that what we do matters to you, you care about our work, and what we do can be an act of worship to you. I pray, Lord, that you will take these offerings that you will make them better and more beautiful than we can imagine, that you'll fill our minds and hearts with imagination for what you can do with us this week through our daily work. We offer it all to you, Lord. May it be an acceptable sacrifice. Amen.